Tonight, remembering the victims of Baltimore's deadly bridge collapse as officials draw up plans to dismantle the wreckage. An up-close look at what will be a massive undertaking to lift that wreckage in hopes of recovering the missing workers and freeing the ship that brought that bridge down. And the wife of one of the workers who survived speaking to NBC News, what she says the workers were doing when the bridge collapsed as the city comes together to pay tribute to the lives lost and honor those who jumped into action. Also tonight, deadly stabbing rampage in Illinois, a man allegedly attacking nearly a dozen people across multiple scenes. Tonight, a family who survived telling what they believed saved their lives. The suspect now facing a slew of charges, including first-degree murder. What we're learning about the moments before the violence unfolded. Four presidents converging in New York City, a rare joint appearance. President Biden and former presidents Obama and Clinton all together for a multi-million dollar fundraiser. Biden's campaign hoping to rake in the cash amid shaky poll numbers heading into the general election. The split-screen moment with former President Trump honoring a fallen New York police officer and ramping up his rhetoric on crime during the officer's wake. Evacuation false alarm. A city in Washington state constantly on edge after numerous false alarms over a dam breach. The mounting frustration and concern that if the real thing happens, it won't be taken seriously. Plus, heroic bystanders. An SUV flipped over in the middle of a Daytona Beach intersection. Onlookers springing into action to get the car upright, being praised for their quick response. And an electric journey, a record-setting drive around the world. Meet the first driver to circumnavigate the globe in an electric vehicle. Her adventure across six continents and 27 countries. Top Story starts right now. And good evening. I'm Aaron Gilchrist in for Tom Yamas. And tonight, a clearer picture of the massive challenge to remove the mangled wreckage of the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore. Drone footage giving us a better look at the damage to the cargo ship that plowed into the Key Bridge early Tuesday morning. A massive coordinated operation now underway to remove the wreckage and open up that waterway vital to the nearby port. Investigators interviewing the crew of the ship, searching for what caused it to lose power just moments before hitting the bridge. Tonight, we are also learning more about the victims, all of them Latino, working to provide for their families. The collapse illustrating the dangers the Latino labor force faces, not just in this instance, but across the country every day. And this powerful moment in Baltimore today, the Orioles devoting opening day to the victims, a moment of silence as the city comes together to honor their lives. We are also just hearing the Biden administration has approved $60 million in emergency funds to help rebuild. NBC's Tom Costello in that city again for us tonight and leads us off. Out on the water with the Army Corps of Engineers and the first up-close look at the massive Dolly container ship and the wreckage of Baltimore's Francis Scott Key Bridge laying on top of it. The Dolly's bow crushed under a massive piece of steel. That weighs somewhere between three and 4,000 tons. We have one of the largest cranes coming in here tonight on the eastern seaboard that picks up 1,000 tons at a time. The water so muddy and dark, divers and drones have struggled to get a clear view. Submerged under the wreckage, the remains of four bridge repair workers still missing. This dash cam video shows them on the bridge a few hours before the disaster. The wife of Julio Cervantes, who survived, tells NBC News the workers were on a break in their cars when the bridge suddenly collapsed. Amazingly, Cervantes survived even though he doesn't swim. The Army Corps of Engineers will have a lead role now in clearing and reopening America's ninth busiest Port. Here's the challenge. They need to clear a 700 foot stretch right here to allow ships to get in and out. But it's not just above water, of course, it's below water. And all of that twisted bridge, that metal underwater, it is razor sharp, posing a potentially lethal threat to ships and the divers working underwater. This work is very unforgiving, and the planning has to be done in extreme detail. And that's the work that's going on today. Potentially very dangerous. Incredibly dangerous. Again today, a team of NTSB investigators on the ship, interviewing the ship's pilots, captain, and crew members. The ship's black box shows alarms going off at 1.24 a.m., indicating a loss of power. The ship's pilot made an urgent call for tugboats and to drop anchor. It's raining, 
It's slippery. Of course, we have the hazardous materials. Uh, we have containers that are open. Uh, we certainly have um, structural damage everywhere. With massive cranes and barges arriving as soon as tonight, experts believe it could take a month to clear the wreckage. When the green button is pushed and dough is given by the incident command for those cranes to start picking it out of the water, it will go faster than most people can expect. But the size and scale of the job, unprecedented. We certainly understand the demand to get this port functioning and open again. We're going to do that, but we're going to do it safely. What have I not asked you that I should? Um, and Tom Costello joins us now from Baltimore. Tom, you talk about the size and scale of the job here, uh, and you've laid it out really clearly here. Help us understand a little bit more about how involved the cleanup operation ultimately will be. So you saw a general there. Uh, he tells me that that river right there is about 50 feet deep. Now, a fully loaded down ship, like the one that is stuck, like the Dolly, that will clear the bottom of the riverbed by only 12 to 18 inches. That's it. Mm. And so they need to make sure that there is no debris on the bottom there that might stick up and then punch a hole in a future vessel. They need to clear everything, everything off the bottom. And you know how many pieces are lying down there on the sand. He tells me they will make that sand as pristine as possible. It will all be cleaned out so that future ships can get through without any, any risk. Aaron? Yeah, quite an undertaking for sure. Tom Costello for us in Baltimore tonight. Tom, thank you. Now, as that work in Baltimore continues, we're learning more tonight about the people presumed killed in that bridge collapse. Beloved fathers, brothers, sons, all of them Latino, a demographic that accounts for one out of every three construction workers in this country. NBC's Stephen Romo has more on their stories. Tonight, the world learning more about the six people, all Latino immigrants, presumed dead in Baltimore's tragic bridge collapse. Mi hermano es el, el motor de la familia. Mi hermano es, es todo para nosotros. Era, es lo mejor. Among them, Menor Suazo, the father of two, described as the driving force for his family in Honduras, who he helped try to find better lives in America. Él fue un pilar fundamental, un bastión para que otras personas de la familia también pudieran viajar hacia allá. There were eight construction workers on the Francis Scott Key Bridge tasked with filling potholes when the massive Dali cargo ship collided with the structure, causing the collapse, according to Maryland transportation officials. Two of the men were saved in the immediate aftermath. The remaining six, including Dorlian Castillo Cabrera and Jose Lopez from Guatemala, Alejandro Fernandez Fuentes from Mexico, and Miguel Luna from El Salvador. Their presumed deaths drawing attention to the severe risks much of America's growing Latino labor force faces, often while doing important jobs that keep the country's economy humming. The Department of Labor lists construction as a high hazard industry where workers are often exposed to serious risks, a field in which Latinos are overrepresented. An estimated 30 percent of all construction workers in the U.S. are Latino, despite the group making up just about 18 percent of the total workforce. The death rate for Latino construction workers in the U.S. was nearly 42 percent higher than the death rate for non-Latino workers in 2020. One potential reason, fear from some immigrant workers over what will happen if they speak up about labor issues. It is a little bit more dangerous for uh, Latino workers working in fear if, if they go somewhere to complain as to, as to what happens to them and their family tomorrow if they complain today. A devastating reality hitting home tonight for the family of Jose Lopez, whose body has not been recovered. His daughter has not stopped asking about it. <laughs> Miguel Luna disappearing just a week after posting this joyous video of a gender reveal for his future grandchild. And Menor Suazo's brother still in disbelief that a casual Sunday afternoon goodbye would be their last. The último que nací,
Stephen Romo joins us now from New York City. Stephen, uh, you, you talked about a fear of raising flags about concerns on some work sites. Uh, are, are there other reasons, any other reasons that Latinos may be more at risk on some of these work sites? Yeah, it's a good question, Aaron. It's not just that fear of coming forward, but also the language barrier itself. Oftentimes, safety instructions and just directions for the day are in English. And of course, that can be a huge roadblock to someone whose native language is Spanish and is not familiar with English. And the frustrating thing about that, Aaron, is that, of course, can be fixed with the simple translation. Aaron? Yeah. All right, Stephen Romo for us tonight. Stephen, thank you. And we have new details tonight on that deadly stabbing rampage in Rockford, Illinois. Four people dead, several others hurt there. Authorities now revealing the identity of the suspect and what may have led to the attack. NBC's Maggie Vespa has the latest. Tonight, as Rockford struggles to understand the carnage, the accused hacker in Wednesday's deadly stabbing spree, 22-year-old Christian Soto in court facing 13 charges, from first-degree murder to home invasion, for police say a rampage spanning five crime scenes across this northern Illinois community. They say Soto attacked 11 people total, killing four, including a mother and son, a mailman on his route, and a 15-year-old girl, Jenna Newcomb. Jenna died? saving her sister and her friend. Prosecutors today saying the spree started when Soto visited a friend in the first house who he said gave him laced marijuana. Soto said he became paranoid after the drug usage. He said he retrieved a knife from the kitchen and proceeded to stab Jacob and Ramona to death. From there, they say he targeted at random, driving his truck onto lawns, breaking into one home where three teenage girls were watching a movie, grabbing a bat. He started swinging the bat, striking all the female victims. Darlene Weber says Soto came in their back door, attacking her and her children. He looked at me, he just had the world's biggest smile on his face. He was smiling. He looked like the devil incarnate. They say the family dog, Brandy, bit Soto on the leg as Weber's son fought him off. And I grabbed a syrup bottle and started beating him with it. I'm not even kidding. If it wasn't for him, I don't think that I'd be standing talking to you right now. I really don't. It did. It was frightening. Tonight, a woman who identified herself as Soto's mother telling NBC News he's a loving person and he has never hurt anybody before. We never felt threatened by him. We can't believe that is my son. And Maggie Vespa joins us now from outside a hospital in Rockford, Illinois, where many of the survivors of this attack are. Maggie, uh, do we have an update on, on the people who were injured in this? Yeah, Aaron, we actually just got it from the staff inside here. This is OSF Healthcare St. Anthony Medical Center. This is where all the survivors who needed to be hospitalized, like you talked about, were taken. In fact, one of them actually died here. One of the four who died in this attack died here. One has been treated and discharged. We're told, obviously, that's good news. Basically, two tonight remain hospitalized here, and we're told, Aaron, they are thankfully in fair condition. Maggie Vespa for us today. Maggie, thank you. And new tonight, we are getting a look inside a deadly school bus crash in Texas we first told you about last week. Dash cam video showing the bus being hit by a concrete truck on a highway outside Austin before rolling over onto its side. Two people killed in that crash, including a five-year-old boy. We should warn you, the video you're about to see may be hard to watch. Here's NBC's Priscilla Thompson. Tonight, new video shows the terrifying moment a Texas school bus full of preschoolers was hit head on by a concrete truck. Requesting incident commander, law enforcement out on the scene. I can actually hear there's a lot of chaos. Dash cam video from the bus released by the school district shows the moment police say that truck veered into the bus's lane. The bus appears to roll onto its side as Good Samaritans run toward the more than 40 children and nearly a dozen adults who police say were on board. I believe there's going to be 10 kids that are going to be going to tell Children's to by uh, Travis County EMS. Five-year-old Ulysses Rodriguez Montoya was killed, officials say. His teacher remembering him as a loving child who enjoyed drawing dinosaurs and telling stories. Police say a driver behind the bus was also killed. The crash occurred Friday afternoon on Highway 21 just outside of Austin as the kids were returning from a field trip to the zoo. It's tough. It's very tough. Hector Campos's five-year-old daughter, Kaliana, was on the bus. Her mom, Angelica, had chaperoned the trip. The fact that I was there 
I spent the day with all those kids. It's just heartbreaking. Callie, how are you doing? Good. Good? What do you remember? Like, uh, we like rolled on the bus. She closed her eyes when it happened, so she wouldn't get glass in her in her eyes or anywhere. The 2011 model school bus did not have seat belts, the district confirmed, adding that they only began buying buses with seat belts in 2017 when the state law changed. Police say the driver of the concrete truck did not appear impaired and that the investigation is in its early stages, leaving many unanswered questions for parents like Hector. Someone just needs to be held accountable. We need some kind of answers for the kids that are kid that's passed away and for their families, they need answers. Priscilla Thompson, NBC News. Well, now we turn to power and politics and New York City, where the race for the White House is taking center stage. President Biden's campaign planning a star-studded fundraiser tonight in Manhattan that will include celebrities and two former presidents. This while former President Trump was nearby attending the wake of a New York police officer killed on the job. NBC's Gabe Gutierrez reports. Tonight, President Biden arriving in New York side by side with his former running mate. Under heavy security, the Biden campaign hosting a star-studded fundraiser, a hall of presidents at Radio City Music Hall. Biden, Obama, and Clinton with celebrities including Lizzo and Queen Latifah. The campaign says the event will rake in at least $25 million as Democrats set the stage for the general election. I've never been more optimistic about our future. I know I'm only 40 years old. <laughs> times two plus one. But a new poll shows former President Trump performing well in a head-to-head -head matchup and that just 38 percent of Americans approve of President Biden's handling of the economy, just 30 percent on immigration. We're here. Today, the president's visit to Manhattan sparked protest over the war in Gaza. Aides have said former President Obama, like many Democrats, has been worried President Biden could lose. But last summer, during a private lunch at the White House, NBC News reported the two men discussed what was at stake in 2024. Former President Obama now taking an increasingly active role in the campaign as Democrats tonight show a united front against former President Trump. As you know, Joe is an extraordinary friend and partner. He was by my side for eight years. Mr. Trump just a few miles away today, attending the wake of NYPD officer Jonathan Diller, who was shot and killed this week during a traffic stop. New York City's mayor says the suspect had more than 20 prior arrests. The former president today meeting with Officer Diller's wife and their one-year-old son. We have to stop it. We have to get back to law and order. We have to do a lot of things differently because this is not working. This is happening too often. And Gabe Gutierrez joins us now from New York City. Gabe, I know the campaign wants this to be a big night, but at the same time, there are demonstrators who have a message they want to get across. Talk to us about what you're seeing and hearing tonight. Uh, yeah, that's right, Aaron. As we mentioned in our report, you know, there have been uh, some protests here throughout the afternoon, but I want to show you what's going on right now. If we can pan over here, you can see the crowd that is gathered right outside Radio City Music Hall. And Aaron, this is a challenge for President Biden and for the campaign. Of course, Democrats, some more progressive Democrats, as we've been reporting, really slamming the president over his handling of the Israel-Hamas war, and they want to make their voices heard. This is a challenge for the campaign as it tries to head into the general election. Of course, in Michigan, could prove to be a huge problem, especially after there was a, a, an organized effort to try to get people to vote uncommitted in the primary. Now you see that this is not going away. Again, this crowd gathering here right outside of Radio City Music Hall within earshot of those three presidents, Aaron. And Gabe, you, you mentioned uh, as well that the campaign is hoping to raise a lot of money, obviously, with this event. What do we know about the, the final figures, what they look like, what this might mean for the larger 2024 presidential race in, in terms of fundraising? Well, Aaron, though, with the campaign, the latest that they're saying is that they uh, expect to raise more than $25 million from this fundraiser alone. Again, they're billing it as a historic first-of-its-kind event. And Democrats have been outpacing Republicans in recent weeks when it comes to fundraising. So, again, the Biden campaign hoping that this gives them the financial boost heading into those next couple months to really get their message out there across the country.
country and especially in those battleground states, Aaron. Gabe Gutierrez in New York City. Gabe, thank you. Moving on now to the weather and the heavy rain making its way along the East Coast. Tonight, more than 12 million people under flood watches. Rainfall as much as four inches traveling north along the eastern seaboard. This weather is also putting a damper on opening day for some major league baseball teams. The Mets and the Phillies both postponing their season home openers now set for tomorrow. For more on the forecast, NBC News meteorologist Angie Lastman is joining us now. So, Angie, how long is this going to be around? Is rain going to be with us through the night? Yeah, Aaron, in some spots, unfortunately, it is. The farther north you live up into parts of New England, we are going to see some rain and we are going to see some snow even into tomorrow. Places like Philadelphia, D.C., New York, you're going to see that rain wrapping up by the time 9, 10, 11 o'clock rolls around. Some improvements will be made here into the overnight hours, but we still got the flood watches up for a couple of spots, the Mid-Atlantic in particular. In parts of New England. Those are the spots, especially the farther north you go, that we're going to look for trouble tomorrow. Notice the improvements that we see as the day goes on. As we get into your Friday afternoon, it will be dry in Boston, but that early morning commute, it's still going to be bumpy. You'll still likely run into some ponding on those roadways. As we get into the later parts of the day, though, some of that snow starts to work into parts of northern New England. Uh, Angie, before I let you go, I do want to ask you about the West Coast, too. Uh, there are some areas that are bracing for some severe weather for the Easter weekend, right? Yeah, we've got a couple of storm systems. One they were dealing with across parts of the Pacific Northwest today. We've got rain for that one. Then we've got a secondary system that's going to impact folks a little farther south, and specifically California as we get into tomorrow. It's the Bay Area and points south of that that we'll watch. Here's how it plays out into your Friday. Notice San Francisco getting a lot of that heavy rain through your day tomorrow, and it doesn't stop here as we get into your Saturday evening. There, we'll see some really impressive rainfall rates. That means rock slides, mud slides, all of that uh, additional flooding is going to be a concern here as we get into the next couple of days. By the time we hit Sunday, potentially three to five inches of rain in that region. Aaron. Angie Lastman for us. Angie, thank you. And still ahead tonight, a public health emergency declared in Puerto Rico over dengue fever, the symptoms to look out for, and the chances the outbreak could reach the continental U.S. Plus, an emergency alert sending residents running for higher ground in Washington state, only to find out it was a false alarm. Why they're now threatening to sue the company that operates a nearby dam. And a crash caught on camera in Daytona Beach, Florida, the bystanders who rushed in to rescue that driver. Stay with us, Top Story is just getting started. Welcome back. We want to take you to a small town in Washington state where residents are outraged after an evacuation alarm was triggered by mistake for an eighth time. The emergency warning system meant to signal potentially life-threatening dam breaches, sending residents running for higher ground only to find out it was a false alarm. Some now threatening to sue the dam's operator. NBC's Dana Griffin reports. An alert system designed to protect the lives of Carnation Washington's 2,100 residents turning into a source of distress. It makes me mad. It's heart-wrenching. I can't fathom why this is happening anymore. Over the last four years, an emergency dam failure siren has sounded eight times when it wasn't supposed to, prompting residents to evacuate and seek higher ground. The latest false alarm sounding on Wednesday morning. I grabbed my dogs, my cat, and I grabbed my brother's ashes. That was it. This was the all-clear announcement 21 minutes later. But by then, residents say their fear and frustrations had reached a breaking point. We've got sobbing kids as they think that a mudslide is going to come over our town, only to realize that, oh, it's just another false alarm, head back home. This is PTSD for everyone in our community. Carnation sits in the Snoqualmie Valley, 17 miles from the Tolt River Dam. If the dam were to breach, a wall of water and debris would come down the causeway, potentially destroying the town. The city of Seattle, which owns the dam, and Seattle Public Utilities, which operates it, say they are investigating what triggered the alarm. Tonight, more than 21 hours after the latest scare, Carnation City leaders demanding action. We are done with apologies. We are done with I'm so sorry, because it will happen again. They're now proposing to sue the city of Seattle and have the dam decommissioned altogether. The dam needs to be drained. The first false evacuation alert in 2020 took more than an hour to correct residents say and triggered a traffic jam along the exit route. But by the eighth false alarm, some residents noticing the sirens are seemingly being ignored. I didn't have to deal with any traffic, which is actually very concerning. 
nobody else was evacuating. In a statement, Seattle Public Utilities writing in part, we are aware and sympathetic to the frustration and concern expressed by residents and officials. We verified the dam was safe and immediately launched an investigation. SPU will not stop investigating until we determine what happened. And Dana Griffin joins us now from Los Angeles, our bureau there. Dana, uh, what happened? That's what we want to know, right? Have the city or the utility company given any sort of indication about why these sirens are going off even when there's no emergency? Yeah, that's a big question, Aaron. Seattle Public Utilities did not did confirm that one of the prior false alarms was accidentally triggered by a worker. It's unclear about the other seven. Now, residents say there are also safety concerns, including the need for road closures once an alarm is sounded to prevent people from coming back into town as everyone, as everyone is evacuating because it causes congestion. Aaron. All right, Dana Griffin for us in L.A. tonight. Dana, thank you. When we come back, the MLB star off the roster. Tampa Bay's Wander Franco placed on leave just hours before the team's home opener. The criminal investigation he's under in the Dominican Republic. That's next. And we are back now with Top Stories News Feed. The House moving forward with an impeachment of Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. Speaker Mike Johnson has notified Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer he will send the articles of impeachment to the upper chamber on April 10th. Schumer's office says senators will be sworn in for trial the next day. The House voted to impeach Mayorkas back in February, accusing him of violating U.S. immigration laws and lying about the scope of the migrant crisis. A group of bystanders in Florida caught on camera saving a driver in Daytona Beach. New video showing a car T-boning an SUV. You see it right there, causing it to flip onto its side. Watch this. A group of uh, gathers there to check on the driver, and then you see them working together to turn that car upright. Daytona Beach police posting this video, thanking the citizens for stepping up. That driver was not seriously hurt. Tampa Bay shortstop Wander Franco on leave tonight amid a criminal investigation in the Dominican Republic. The Ray is confirming the news just before their home opener against the Toronto Blue Jays. Franco being investigated in the DR for allegedly having sex with a 14-year-old girl. He has not been formally charged and he has denied the allegations. Franco did not report to spring training but is still being paid his $2 million salary. And the Biden administration restoring protections for threatened plants and animals. A rule change reinstating blanket protections for species newly declared threatened. The Trump administration had rolled back the rule, one that may allow wildlife experts to act quicker. Officials will also no longer have to consider economic impacts when deciding whether a species needs protection. Well, now to a health alert and the alarming uptick in cases of dengue fever in Puerto Rico. The island has reportedly nearly 550 cases of that mosquito-borne disease so far this year, and officials there are now declaring a public health emergency. I want to bring in Dr. Jason Rasgon, the Dorothy Four Huck and J. Lloyd Huck Endowed Chair in Disease, Epidemiology, and Biotechnology at Penn State. Also with us, Dr. Nahid Badalia, Infectious Diseases Physician and Director of Boston University Center on Emergency Infectious, uh, Emerging Infectious Diseases. She also served uh, as a senior advisor to the Biden administration. Dr. Badalia, I do want to start with you. Uh, first, uh, you know, this is not a disease we talk about a lot here in the continental U.S. Can you start by explaining what dengue fever is and what some of the symptoms might look like? Erin, it's a viral illness that's transmitted by a mosquito. That means the mosquito bites somebody who's infected and then bites somebody else who's not infected, transmitting the virus. And the general symptoms are fever and headaches, uh, body aches, uh, muscle aches. That's generally why it gets a second name called br breakbone fever. That's, it often is called in areas in high endemic uh, places and a rash. In most cases, the illness is self-limited. That means it lasts between seven to 10 days and then resolves. But in about 5% of the cases, uh, people may get severely ill enough to be needing hospitalization and ICU care because they could see abnormal bleeding, what we call hemorrhagic fever, as well as support for their organs uh, that might need ICU level care. Well, Dr. Razgan, let me bring you in here. Can you help us understand a little bit more about the type of mosquito that this uh, disease uh, is spread by and, and what people need to know about it? 
So dengue virus is spread by several different mosquitoes, but the, the vast majority of it is spread by a mosquito called Aedes aegypti, which is a mosquito which is native to Africa, but is highly invasive and basically has invaded um, completely around the, the, the world in the last few hundred years. Uh, it actually transmits multiple different viruses, but um, dengue virus, Zika virus, Myaro virus, other ones. Um, usually um, when they bite an infected person, they pick up the virus, the virus incubates in the mosquito, and then it bites somebody else during a subsequent feeding event and transmits that virus. And so that's how uh, dengue and, and other arboviruses are transmitted between hosts. I want to come back to you in a second. We we'll talk about the fact that this is something we're seeing around the world. Dr. Medalia, first, uh, we know that Puerto Rico is seeing this increase in cases we've been talking about uh, compared to last year, right? Do we know why we're seeing these numbers go up uh, across the island? Yeah, Aaron, simple. It's climate change and it's travel and our connectivity. Um, so what you've seen is dengue is in about 100 countries and that scope of where it is now is expanding because the world's getting warmer. And you're seeing, you just reported on all the rainfall that's happening. You're seeing a lot more rainfall or unpredictable weather patterns. So even when it's dry, uh, now people are storing water in containers that you know could be really great breeding spots for, for mosquitoes. And so what you're seeing in Puerto Rico, it's about 150% rise in cases compared to last year. But more importantly, that's almost a 225% increase of dengue cases in most of the Americas. So Central America, as well as in Latin America, you're seeing increased number of cases because more places are became, becoming habitable for this mosquito to develop and adapt to. So, Dr. Rasgan, we, we, we talk about climate change. We talk about seeing this uh, across the Americas. Is there a, a real concern that the type of mosquito we're talking about here that infects people with this fever uh, could migrate uh, to the continental U United States, could be here in places like Florida, um, potentially infecting uh, it's people? It's already here. Yeah. It, it has already migrated to, to the southern U.S. It's in Florida, it's in Louisiana, it's in Texas, uh, even in California. Uh, the distri projected distribution of Aedes aegypti actually can go, you know, to relatively large geographic area in the United States, a uh, continental United States. So it is here and it is transmitting uh, local, even local dengue in, in places like Florida and Texas occasionally. Uh, so it, it, it is a big issue. And with climate change and mosquito range expansion, it's going to become an increasing problem over uh, the next few years. All right. So, Dr. Bedalia, I'll give you the last word here. People want to know, what do I do about it? I mean, people are going to be scared to hear that this is something that's already here in the States. If people are thinking about traveling to places like Puerto Rico or some of the other places we've mentioned, uh, what should they be doing? What should they be preparing for? How do we need to pack to sort of protect ourselves or even living in, in our own communities? How do we need to better protect ourselves? Yeah, Aaron, I think it's important to point out that it's not just Puerto Rico, right? I think you've, if anybody has traveled internationally, given that 100 countries have dengue this endemic, you've probably mm. faced this before. And the safest thing to do is to, before you travel, to find out if this is one of the countries you're traveling to is a place where dengue is transmitting. And simple precautions. You know, if you're around areas that might have a lot of mosquitoes wearing loose fitting, long sleeved clothes, particularly in wooded areas. And this is a mosquito that bites during the daytime. So if you're out, you want to make sure you have that mosquito repellent, particularly with something with Picardin or DEET in it. These, you know, these particular chemicals can, that can help address uh, and repel the mosquitoes. In. And then the last thing is if you're taking a nap during the day, sleep under a mosquito net. Those are some simple things you can do to avoid getting bitten. Some really good, important advice. We don't always remember to, to spray on the, the bug spray before we uh, we head out, but something obviously that's gonna protect people in a big way. Uh, doctors, both, thank you. We appreciate you being with us tonight. Thank you. My pleasure. Well, an in-depth look now at a disturbing trend at the U.S. southern border. New reports indicate a dramatic surge in sexual violence against asylum seekers who are waiting in Mexico. This as the U.S. government weighs stricter immigration policies that could increase that wait time. MSNBC contributor Paula Ramos talks to several sexual assault survivors about their experiences and a warning. Parts of this story are incredibly difficult to hear, and they do contain details about rape and other sexual assaults. So we just crossed from Brownsville, Texas, over to Matamoros. Right now, we're in the state of Tamaulipas, which is considered one of the most dangerous places in Mexico, more than anything because of the cartel violence that's taking place here. 
Now, every single person that we've talked to on the ground is telling us that the rate of sexual violence against migrants is escalating, it's increasing, it's getting worse by the day. So we're on our way to a refugee shelter to understand the impact that it's having on the migrants that are crossing from these border towns into the United States. Maria, her husband, and their two children say they had to leave Guatemala last year after receiving death threats from the same gang that had already killed nearly half of her family. No traíamos zapatos, no traíamos ropa, nada. They traveled north, hoping to be near the U.S. border, as they waited for their official immigration appointments, a crucial part of seeking asylum. They had no idea the worst part of their journey would take place just feet away from Texas. Ya puestos aquí en Tamaulipas, en Reynosa, se sube un grupo. Se cruzó una camioneta blanca y subieron vestidos de negro. ¿Quiénes? Y empezaron a decir, somos este, los del Golfo. ¿El cartel del Golfo? Sí. ¿Estaban armados? Sí, este, con pistolas en mano. Y mi marido me quedaba viendo y me dice, nos van a matar. Pero usted en esos momentos, su marido pensaba que ahí... Nos iban a quitar la vida. Y empezaron a quitarlo la, la ropa. Me desvistieron toda delante de él y me empezaron a golpear porque yo les decía que no traía dinero. Y ellos me decían, pásame el teléfono, vamos a contactar a tu familia para que pague tu rescate. No tengo quien pague rescate. Entonces me vas a decir, nos vas a pagar con cuerpo. Empezaron a violarme más de 20 personas. Y me decían, esto te pasa por no pagar. Y para que recuerdes que el territorio mexicano se respeta. Yo les decía, ya no puedo más, déjeme por favor. ¿Usted tiene marcas de, del ataque que sufrió y de las violaciones? Sí. Tengo en mi cabeza, en mi rostro, en mis pies, en mis manos. Me abrieron aquí también. Quería meter drogas para que yo pasara. Yo les dije que no. Many of the migrants in the shelter have endured similar situations. ¿Cuánto tiempo estuviste secuestrada? Como casi un mes. Un mes. Sí. Porque no tengo dinero, entonces me abusó de mí. En ese mes que estuviste secuestrada, ¿te violaron muchas veces? Como cuatro veces. ¿Había sí. más mujeres contigo? Sí, había casa? tres mujeres conmigo. ¿Y las tres, las cuatro estuvieron abusadas también? Sí. What's happening to these women might not be a coincidence. Cartels have developed a systematic organized method to kidnap and collect ransom from migrants on their way to their immigration appointments. Ahorita se están subiendo muchos a los autobuses y preguntando si, si vienen a las citas. Mm. Algunas personas dicen que sí y las bajan les checan sus maletas, les quitan todo su dinero, les pegan para poderles también mandarle ese video a sus familiares para que vean que es verdad que están secuestrados. Doctors Without Borders has seen this crisis up close. From October to December of 2023, they recorded a 70% increase in consultations for sexual violence in Matamoros and Reynosa compared to the prior three months. The first two months of 2024, they have already seen nearly 70 cases. I just got back from talking to three asylum seekers, and at least two of them have been sexually assaulted. Is that what you guys are seeing on the ground, too? Yeah, it's true. I mean, when we have the consultations, our patients also tell us their stories, which are quite traumatizing. The violence is creating a new crisis for many migrants, unwanted pregnancies. Do you offer pregnancy yeah. tests? It is, it is part of the, the protocol that we follow. It is part of, it's actually the first uh, medical treatment. And does Doctors Without Borders also offer access to abortions or abortion pills? Is that something that's part of the work that you do? We are actually very concerned all over the world, wherever we operate. We are very concerned about um, the unwanted pregnancies. We try to ensure that uh, services are being offered to the women and also to ensure that they we ourselves adhere to the laws and norms of the country. What many migrants don't know is that once they cross that border, 
a line that represents security, dreams, and opportunities, they're walking into the realities of post row America. Conoces sobre las leyes de aborto en Estados Unidos en estos momentos, en Texas? No. Paola Ramos joins us now uh, from New York. Uh, Paola, uh, you've spoken to sexual violence survivors hoping to terminate pregnancies, I know, as, as well as some activists who are trying to help migrant women access abortion uh, in a post-Roe America. Can you talk a little bit more about some of the conversation, conversations you had around that? Of course, I think to, to give you context on who these survivors are, right, they're, they're part of this growing trend of migrant women that are stepping into post-Roe America, like you said, with these rape-related unwanted pregnancies. And so I was able to talk to one of them, and one of the things she told me, Erin, is that she very quickly understood the moment that she crossed into Texas that this perception she had of the United States, right, this perception she had of, of the so-called American dream, that perception was very quickly shattered the moment that she realized that she couldn't even access abortion pills in Texas, right? So she was, she was completely shocked by that fact. Um, but then what's interesting is how she shocked herself. Right, through these conversations, she told me that she quickly understood after navigating the very complex legal system in Texas that she was not only able to figure out how to get a self-managed abortion, but that she understood that the stakes are so incredibly high that she found herself willing to risk her own immigration status, break with Texas anti-abortion laws to help other migrant women access these abortion pills. Right? So again, it goes back to this instinct of, of survival Right, that was yeah. both shocking to her and it made her really proud. Well, it, it is a, an incredible and an awful story to have to uh, sort of process and, and for these women to obviously be dealing with these things. We appreciate your reporting on this though, an important story for sure. Paula Ramos, thank you. Thank you so much. And we'll be right back. We're back now with Top Stories Global Watch, and we begin with a deadly bus crash in South Africa. Authorities say at least 45 people were killed when the driver of a passenger bus lost control on a bridge. That vehicle fell more than 150 feet. The bus was carrying people from Botswana to an Easter weekend service in a state along the northern border, an eight-year-old girl believed to be the lone survivor. Facing pressure from the U.S., the Palestinian Authority today announcing a new cabinet. President Mahmoud Abbas announcing the appointment of 22 new ministers as his government faces growing international calls to reform and fight corruption. The Palestinian Authority, which oversees parts of the Israeli-occupied West Bank, has pledged to help rebuild Gaza when the Israel-Hamas war ends. And the British Museum suing a former curator, accusing him of stealing more than 1,800 items and selling them online. The curator, who was in charge of the museum's Greek and Roman Antiquities Department, was fired last summer after gems, gold jewelry, and other artifacts were reported missing. Court documents show hundreds of these items later discovered for sale on eBay. Well, now to the Explorer, pushing the limits of what's possible in electric vehicles. You may know her social handle, Lexi Limitless. She is also the youngest person to visit every country. But over the last few months, uh, she's had her sights on a new record, circumnavigating the globe in an EV. NBC's Priya Shrether has the electrifying story of adventure. From Australia to Zimbabwe, Vietnam to Argentina, Lexi Alford has seen it all and even broken a few world records along the way. For me, breaking world records is always about challenging myself and seeing what's possible. When she was just 21 years old, she stamped her passport into the history books, becoming the youngest person to visit every country. This was a dream of mine for so many years. I got to travel a lot with my family as a kid and fell in love with it. I started backpacking when I turned 18, and a crazy three and a half years later, I ended up breaking that world record and celebrating it in New York City. Now at 25, Lexi has been running down a new dream, circumnavigating the globe in a Ford electric vehicle. When it comes to electric vehicle travel, there's so much speculation on 
what it's like around the world, if it's a viable solution or alternative to normal cars. And I wanted to see what was out there, and I definitely found out. Here's a look at Lexi's most recent globetrotting journey by the numbers. 200 days, 27 countries, six continents, and more than 18,000 miles. Follow me here to watch a new world record be set in real time. Lexi documenting her journey and its challenges on social media as Lexi Limitless. I want to show you how I charge my electric vehicle in the middle of nowhere. From troubles finding places to charge in Zimbabwe. There was literally zero infrastructure for electric vehicles, which meant I had to get a bit more creative. I started doing domestic charging, which is basically using normal household outlets to charge my car. I have to drive in like five hours. To sickness in India that threatened to derail the whole trip. It's so sick. This can't be happening again. It's almost like a domino effect when something like that happens because I had to have to pick up the pace at some points. Lexi determined to finish that moment unfolding earlier this week in southern France. Woo! <laughs> we did it! <laughs> she says what kept her going was the support she got from young women all around the world. I get messages that have said that you know, seeing you know a person that looks like them going out into the world and being brave and making the most out of every experience has inspired them to you know take on other challenges and get out of their comfort zones in their own lives and that's really at the end of the day what it's all about. Priya Shreether, NBC News. Pretty impressive for sure. When we come back, the push to protect local journalism. Our own Harry Smith takes us to a newsroom in Lewiston, Maine, to shine a light on the incredible work being done behind those headlines, making the front page every day. Well, finally tonight, the story of how a group of local newspapers in Lewiston, Maine, are thriving, banding together to cover everything from high school sports and city council meetings to the mass shooting that killed 18 people last year. NBC's Harry Smith now on the vital role they play in their community. At Rowley's in central Maine, many a customer digs into the Lewiston Sun Journal along with their breakfast. Locals have relied on it since 1847, but like many a local paper, its future was anything but certain. It's been tough. I mean, it's no secret. <laughs> Advertising spending is, is down exponentially. Um, our subscriptions are down, and the, the price of a digital subscription is nowhere near the price of a printed subscription. Um, our resources were starting to shrink. I love it. Sun Journal publisher Jody Jalbert has lived in Lewiston all her life. We did as much as we possibly could not to pull the resources out of our newsrooms, but everybody was tight. Until last summer, when the Sun Journal, four other main dailies and 16 weekly papers were sold to the not-for-profit National Trust for Local News. Thank goodness. <laughs> No, it was it was huge relief. We have been for the last 10, 12 years kind of in survival mode, you know, doing what we needed to do to, to move forward and making the hard cuts. And the trust came in um, and started investing and we weren't used to that. <laughs> you know, we had to, to retrain our thought process to a growth mindset instead of a, a shrinking mindset. And it's been a nice change, a very nice change. Marla Hoffman runs our night desk. She's Executive editor Judy Meyer introduced us around, a newsroom full of experienced journalists who knew exactly what needed to be done last October when a gunman opened fire in a bowling alley and a bar here. Almost everybody in this newsroom is bold at that bowling alley. Mm. We've been to Schmangies. We know where it is. We know the people who were involved. And I think we approached it as this is not a crime story. This is a crime against our community. Where the collection A story the Sun Journal continues to work on five months later, right. long after the rest of us have left town. Uh, the feedback that we were getting, people were thankful that they knew to come to the Sun Journal um, for accurate news and information, and just really proud that we were we were able to deliver that. Right. As a local daily, though, high school sports drive interest, as does restaurant news, mm -hmm. and we still run birth notices in our papers. Who does that anymore? Not everyone loves the paper, though. Some elected officials, 
community leaders, we're like pests, says Meyer. There's a lot of mischief that can go on in the dark. And that happens when you don't have local journalists keeping track of what's going on. It's a difficult business. You've stuck with it for several decades. Do you know why? Because I can't not. <laughs> um, I, I love it. It's, um, there's no other job where you truly feel that part of the community, I, in my opinion. <laughs> Mainers have relied on the Sun Journal for more than 175 years. Thanks to the trust, they still can. And be assured, delivery person Beth Combs will see that you get your copy, even at your back door. Well, thanks for watching Top Story. I'm Aaron Gilchrist in for Tom Yamas. Stay right there. More NBC News now on the way. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.